Are you afraid of losing your mind? Well, this evening, that's what we're going to be discussing. Not how to lose your mind, but how to prevent that loss. Unfortunately, uh, it is becoming more and more common for individuals to have neurodegeneration, which culminates into Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or uh, other forms of dementia. And so this evening, we're gonna be talking about three steps that you can take right now to potentially save yourself or your loved ones from that issue. Hi, I'm Labor Allen, and this is the Natural Health Clinic's live broadcast of Don't Lose Your Mind. So let's get right into it. You know, there's three different aspects to brain health, and we really need to pay attention to all three. Uh, sometimes there's more attention paid to one more than the others, uh, but really in order to be as certain as we can uh, to uh, protect ourselves and our loved ones from these uh, brain degenerative diseases that are becoming so prevalent, uh, equal attention needs to be looked at uh, through these different aspects. So one of the most important things that our brain has to have is stable fuel. Just like with a vehicle, if you don't have stable fuel, well, what do you know is eventually going to happen? You know that, okay, let me see what is going on here. There we go. You know, sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, you <laughs> Technical difficulties. Uh, you know that, uh, uh, there's eventually going to be a problem with the fuel system or with the car itself. It's going to stop moving down the road. Well, the same thing with the brain. If it does not have stable fuel, and that means that it doesn't have too much fuel at some point or too little fuel at some point, uh, as long as it's stable, it's going to be operating very smoothly and very well. But if at some point uh, there's instability within that fuel system, within that amount of fuel within the brain, then just like that car, it's going to stop working properly. So what is the fuel that I'm referring to? Well, specifically I'm referring to glucose, glucose in the brain. Our brain needs very, very little of it in order to function well. It doesn't need huge amounts, and it needs stable amounts throughout the entire day. The problem is, is that it is all too frequent, uh, I would say exceptionally common, uh, especially with the way that most individuals, including children, eat, that they have surges of fuel continuously all throughout the day within their brain. Don't think so? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever uh, eaten lunch and then soon after, let's say 30 minutes thereafter, uh, you took a nap or at least would like to have taken a nap? Yes? that means that you had uh, instability of glucose within the brain. And more importantly, if you had this kind of foggy feeling with it, which I know some of you have, that actually means you lost neurons, which are brain cells at that exact point in time. That's what was causing the kind of brain fog or cloudy headedness. That's right. That's what the lack of stability with the fuel or the glucose within the brain does it causes brain cells, neurons, to die. So you could see how if day after day, meal after meal, you have these feelings, uh, you have this uh, cloudy brain, you have this fatigue feeling, those neurons are dying, well, eventually it's going to get to a point where enough have died that it starts creating different symptoms. And children are no different. Haven't you seen children that have been given, you know, carbohydrates or different amounts of sugar and they're all ramped up for a period of time and then they crash, literally, they may go to sleep. The same thing is happening to their little developing brains. And yes, it's even worse at that point. And then there are certain forms of uh, sugars that the body will eventually metabolize into glucose that uh, even cause more serious injury to the brain uh, because of the way that the body either does or doesn't <laughs> metabolize it, however you want to look at it, uh, as well as the different forms of toxicities that may be in those substances 
as well. So the first aspect that we need to pay a, a great deal of attention to in order to prevent the degeneration of our brains, of our neurological system, is stable fuel at all times. Not too much, not too little, just right, as Goldilocks would say. Second aspect, we obviously need blood in the brain, right? Circulating well, not clots, not pooling. <laughs> there needs to be a flow of the, uh, of the uh, blood throughout the brain. And so think about how serious it is. We know if there's a lack of uh, oxygen to a baby's brain during uh, childbirth or whatever the case may be, that causes serious damage. We know that there, if there is a stroke, uh, either it could be a lack of circulation to the brain, so they're not getting enough blood flow into the brain, or it could be like a hemorrhagic stroke where there's a, uh, you know, pooling of blood within a certain uh, system or area of the brain. That causes a problem. Regardless of the reason, the issue is a circulation problem. So, do you think you have a circulation problem, especially a peripheral circulation problem? You might say, well, I have, I have no idea. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you ever uh, have cold hands and feet when you ordinarily should not? So I'm saying if you go outside in 10 degree below weather and walk barefoot in the snow, you should have cold feet, <laughs> at least, all right? <laughs> not to mention, that's pretty silly. But anyway, uh, if you have cold extremities, hands and feet, where others don't, you know, like it's 75 or 80 degrees in a room, and you notice your, your hands and feet are cool, uh, typically speaking, that indicates that you have a peripheral circulation issue. Or the same thing if your, your arms fall asleep easily, your feet fall, fall asleep easily, that also indicates a peripheral circulation issue. So you can be sure that if your feet are having a problem getting enough blood flow, especially if you're standing up, because guess what? Gravity works down, right? Unless you're standing on your head. Uh, but if your feet are having circulation issues, then you can also be sure that your brain is as well. So there are things that you must do if uh, you're a person that has those types of issues to ensure that you start improving the circulation within the brain. So stability of blood, stability of oxygen within the brain, which is what the blood supplies, one of the things anyway, is very, very important. Third, The third aspect of brain health is mitigating any damage that has already been done. Well, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> if you ever get a chance to watch an hour-long documentary, it's actually, if you're, uh, it's on Amazon. It's free if you have Amazon Prime. It's called Brains in Danger. Uh, it's very, very good. But in there, they talk about different forms of toxicity that in every single person man, woman, and children, in infants actually, when they've been tested for these particular chemicals, 100% of the time it's been found. And it is known that these chemicals, so think about it, 100% of the people that have been tested, no matter the age range, infancy to, you know, uh, geriatric, 100% of the time found. And that if, if these chemicals are in the body, they are known, known, to lower IQ. Absolutely, not, not that they might. They do lower the IQ, especially in youth. And 100% of the youth tested had these chemicals. So that means the IQs are dropping, right? How can you avoid that, that uh, obvious uh, trend? And in fact, there's a few studies that have been done, uh, one of them in Finland, uh, as far as military, young military use, IQ tests that they take as they enter the military, and since the mid-1990s, up to that point, you know, before the 1990s, mid-1990s, IQs had been increasing. Then mid-1990s come around, IQs by the rate of two points per decade have been decreasing. But it's not only in Finland. They've done multiple studies in different countries now, and the same thing applies. So the point is that these chemicals are actively damaging our brains. So we must make sure that as much as possible, we mitigate that damage. How do we do that? Number one, 
we make sure that the chemicals as much as possible are not anywhere near our environment. One of the ones, common ones that they uh, tested were uh, fire retardants. You say, oh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, have any fire retardants. I don't need to worry about that. Really? <clears throat> well, let me ask you, uh, if, you have a, if you have an infant, do you have a stroller for that infant? Yes, okay. And uh, when, it, when it was, or if your child is an infant, and that infant is sitting in the headrest, so, you know, because you have to protect the head and doesn't move around and so forth, because the, uh, the infant cannot uh, control its neck, have you used one of those head cushions? Well, guess what? 85% of the head cushions tested contain fire retardant. So that means your baby has gotten fire retardants now into its, uh, its body. Same thing for cushions, uh, beds, carpeting, uh, car upholstery, I mean, you name it. it, it can, it's everywhere, and you certainly have it in your body. Uh, cleaning chemicals contain all sorts of things. Of course, there's the plastics and the bisphenol A and all the different kinds of thing, uh, chemicals that are contained in the plastics. So those are very damaging as well. So as much as you can, try to avoid those things. Right? Try to find known sources that do not contain those types of chemicals if possible. But let's say it's not possible. So now you have these chemicals within your body, potentially within your brain. What do you do? Well, then you want to do things that improve the flow of the glymphatic system. What's the glymphatic system? That is actually the lymphatic system, which just over the last two or three years has literally been discovered. If you can imagine, new entire systems of the body still being discovered today. Well, two to three years ago, they discovered the system. It is a lymphatic system uh, within the brain itself. And that lymphatic system is responsible in large part for moving out and cleansing uh, infectious materials, uh, toxicities, whatever the case may be. All right? So do things that improve the lymphatic system and that will help you to a large extent mitigate damage. Now there are other things. <clears throat> there are other glands, hormones, and even organ systems that affect brain function. One of the common ones and one of the, the big ones, primary, is the thyroid. Now very common for individuals to have uh, thyroid dysfunction. I mean, 25 to 35 million people just within the United States have been diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Okay, so that is a significant number who have thyroid diseases. They are typically, if they go to a medical practitioner, put on some kind of thyroid medication which, by the way, does nothing to improve the function of the thyroid, simply increases the actual thyroid hormone that is testable within the blood and can very often decrease the function of the thyroid. <coughs> but regardless, we're not on a thyroid presentation uh, this evening. Uh, it, it doesn't help the actual thyroid gland. And the other thing that it certainly does is it begins to create deficiencies of different types of nutrients within the body. Yes, every uh, medication, or at least most medications, 99% of them, literally create nutritional deficiencies of certain uh, nutrients. And there's actually different websites that you can go to. You can uh, punch in or type in the different medication that you are taking, and you will get a list of the different uh, nutritional deficiencies that that medication creates and uh, what symptoms that those deficiencies may be creating. So one of the common ones that, for example, uh, Synthroid or the generic form levothyroxine, those medications create is an iodine deficiency. Iodine is necessary to the function of the thyroid gland in order for it to produce thyroid hormone. So if you don't have enough iodine, that in itself creates a thyroid problem and is known to create brain problem, all right? And they find that women who have low thyroid hormone, 
who have a low thyroid function, uh, their children have problems, all right? So it greatly affects, you know, low thyroid function in the mothers greatly affects uh, the children. So that means that they can be born already with certain deficiencies, already with certain uh, propensities towards brain dysfunction or other types of dysfunction, okay? So very, very important. Now, what are some, you know, uh, simple signs of neurodegeneration? Well, I'll tell you the most common one. And what I would like you to do is from now on, when you're watching, let's say, television or YouTube channels or any kind of video, including the one you're watching now, start looking for signs of uh, neurodegeneration. It's very simple. You just watch if they have, you know, droopiness in an eyelid or if they have, uh, especially around the mouth, that's an easy one to to note that there is not symmetrical movement of the muscles around the mouth. If you start looking, you'll find that at least 50% of the people on television or movies, movie stars, have the very beginning signs of neurodegeneration. It's incredibly interesting. So just start uh, training yourself to look for that and you will be absolutely amazed. And of course, uh, check yourself as well. So that's a very common sign. Now. Uh, how about some others, which I need to start writing. It's over here. I'm not quite sure. It looks like you can, yeah. So uh, another one is, uh, you know, they often call it in medicine essential tremor, which means, well, it's not really caused by any disease. Uh, otherwise, they'd call it, you know, if you had really bad tremors, Parkinson's or something like that. But just an essential tremor, all right? You can have it for decades from being, since the time you're a teenager. If you have a consistent essential tremor, that indicates that there is a lack of certain uh, motor control or deficiencies within certain uh, brain system, especially the basal ganglia, and that can be the beginning signs of neurodegeneration. All right, other simple ones I've already mentioned. If you have brain fog after eating meals, that is a sure sign of the beginning stages of neurodegeneration. You're literally losing neurons at that point. That's why you're having the brain fog, all right? So uh, let me write that one down. Number three, brain fog. So if you have uh, any of those or all three of those, then you can be sure that you are actually, if left unaltered, heading towards uh, neurodegeneration some at some point within your uh, lifetime so that's brain fog after meals okay all right so uh, I mentioned the basal ganglia a little bit earlier so let's just briefly talk about the different uh, systems of the brain all right so these are the five main brain systems I'm not getting in every single you know facet of the brain, just five main brain systems. We'll talk about them briefly. So the first one right here, it's called the prefrontal cortex, helps you with uh, judgment, all right? However, when it starts becoming a little bit dysfunctional, you're gonna notice uh, tendencies towards weepiness at the drop of a hat, all right? Just the slightest thing tends to create weepiness. That's a prefrontal cortex dysfunction, all right? Uh, it can create uh, depressions, feelings of discouragement, lack of motivation, okay? Next one, cingulate, that's right here. The cingulate is a really common one that I find with patients and what that has to do with is the ability or inability to relax your mind. So if you find yourself constantly thinking and you, <clears throat> you know, like you're thinking about a situation that occurred and you just think about it over and over and you play it in your mind over and over and it's like, God, I wish I would stop thinking about that, but you can't, that's cingulate. Or if you lay in your bed at night uh, and you're asleep and then you wake up and you can't go back to sleep because your mind's going you repeatedly, you know, from this thing to that thing, though, over and over and over, that is cingulate, okay? So that's a dysfunction within the cingulate. Next is the basal ganglia. So that's in the occipital lobe area of the brain and that uh, controls motor function. Uh, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, if it's dysfunctional things as Parkinson's, essential tremors, et cetera, okay? All right, uh, then you have temporal lobes, all right? So that's in this area. Um, you know, if you have issues here, you can have serious issues with it anyway. You can have uh, uh, seizures, uh, uh, a lot of irritability, uh, you know, memory tension issues, type things like that. 
And then finally, the limbic system. The limbic system is the uh, emotional seat of the brain. It's the emotional system of the brain. It generates raw emotion. So that also has a lot to do with your feelings and um, you know depression and senses of well-being and uh, a lot to do everything to do really with your feelings. So if you note that you have any kinds of those symptoms then you can start equating it to the different types of brain system and if you have those symptoms and that means that there is a dysfunction with the brain system then that could mean that in the future you may be heading towards neurodegeneration. So uh, what we do in the office is we can actually test if there is any uh, dysfunction within these brain systems and what's even more important what may be creating it. Okay so the first thing is if we find let's say the cingulate which is very common Right? It's one of the most common things I find as far as brain with my patients. So first thing you want to find out if you find that it's weak, which I'm, equals dysfunction, so if it's weak, uh, is is there anything that's inhibiting the proper function? Right? So before you want to start throwing some kind of nutrients at it, you always want to find out is there something that's blocking the normal function of this area? Because if you throw nutrients at something, but it's being blocked from functioning correctly, then is it going to use the nutrients that you're taking correctly? The answer is no, of course not. So you must find if there's an inhibitory process going on. Uh, what could be creating that? Well, uh, it could be that there's a problem with the glymphatic system. So there's toxicity in there the body can't get out, the brain can't remove, and so therefore there's a dysfunction there. So if that's the case, we would address it. Whatever it is, if there is one, then we will address it. And then, once we've addressed that issue, we'll see if that area of the brain needs very specific, very targeted support. Uh, oftentimes it doesn't. It just needs to have whatever is inhibiting it removed. And it already has within the blood supply, within the circulation, or within the body tissues, the nutrients it needs to fix that problem, it just wasn't able to because it was continuously being inhibited, being stopped uh, due to whatever the situation was. So uh, that's what we do in the office. Now of course one of the main things we also do is work on stable fuel, which is diet. All right, We must address diet in order to get uh, proper functioning of the brain and really the entire body. Diet is primary. Diet is pivotal. Okay? Without diet in place, the proper way of feeding the body, no matter if you have exactly the right nutrients uh, through supplementation or whatever the case, you're not going to get anywhere. It simply isn't going to happen. Diet is primary. So we talked about always having stable fuel, right? We don't want too much. We don't want too little. So does that mean that we just need to, you know, carb up? Absolutely not, because when you carb up, guess what happens? You have an increase, then you have a decrease. The very thing we don't want. So why do you think that uh, that is a particular issue within the United States at least? Because everybody eats a boatload of carbohydrates. Oh, I need pasta. Oh, I need pizza. Oh, I love ice cream. Oh, I love this gigantic bowl of margaritas. And guess what? You have a gigantic surge of sugar, and then boom, you have a low. And you also have dead neurons. Bye-bye, brain. Okay, so that's a recipe for a disaster. So what you need to do is have moderate amounts of animal proteins, meat, fish, fowl, and eggs, if you're not sensitive to any of those things, and vegetables to supply your body with nutrients. And the third thing, incredibly important, because 50% of your brain is this, is give you one answer, you're right, fat. You must consume fat and a large quantity of it because that can also help fuel the brain. Okay, in fact it's a better fuel for the brain than the glucose. But that also is a topic for another presentation. So anyway, uh, diet is one of the main things that we work with um, with patients. Okay, all right, let's see. And of course, with circulation, we do the same thing. We can, we can test if it is a circulation issue that's creating a problem with the different brain systems or if there's a problem with carotid arteries or whatever the case may be. We actually can ascertain if there's a problem within the circulatory system and then what may be stopping it from functioning or flowing correctly 
give the body what it needs to address that issue, and then support the entire system as need be. And uh, of course, we work the same way through mitigating damage through the toxicity. All right, find out if that is a problem for the body, for the brain, and what it needs in order to remove that toxicity. Uh, then the other thing that I uh, had mentioned that is also very incredibly important for brain health is stimulation. The brain must be stimulated uh, constantly and consistently. So that's why when you find individuals who retire, if they don't remain active, if they just you know, kind of stop life at that point, they have a rapid decline. And it's really because they're not having the mental stimulation. So mental stimulation is extremely important. Now that can be directly through doing puzzles and crosswords and uh, you know, arts and crafts and uh, you know, or what, whatever the case may be, things that create learning new languages, uh, things that create mental activity. However, uh, physical activity as well, especially learning new uh, skills, actually, even though it is physical, greatly stimulates the brain as well. So you can also stimulate the brain through physical activity. Uh, there are also certain receptors, like getting a massage, uh, can also stimulate brain. Chiropractic adjustments, even acupuncture has been found to stimulate certain areas of the brain. So different things can stimulate the brain, but it is extremely important to do so. Okay, so let me look, see if anyone has any questions. If so, I will go ahead and address them. Give me one second to get there. Okay, so here I am, and let's see, hello, uh, yep, good to see you there, Angela, Martha, wonderful information, good, I'm glad you're finding it helpful. Okay, so uh, now is the time. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the uh, comment box now, and I will address them uh, while I talk about if you're watching this and you would like to go the next step. And if you know you may be having some neurodegeneration tendencies uh, and like to get seen, have an initial consultation, here's your next step. It's an initial consultation. <laughs> that was tough, right? All right, so here's how it works. Uh, typically, regular price, our initial consultation is $249. Uh, it schedule a couple hours anyway. It's a pretty long appointment because we have... Uh, different testing to do and you know we have to work up and we have uh, intake and there's a lot to do so make sure you have a couple hours of time for that particular um, appointment uh, that also includes the uh, report of findings as well which is usually about 15 minutes between you and I and we'll, I'll go over in detail what has been found through all the testing and then lay out the plan to help you improve your health so that's what the report of findings is so it includes all of that uh, so usually that is regularly $249. Now, when you are referred to us uh, through one of our patients, then you get $100 off of that. So then it becomes $149. Better deal. However, if you respond to the offer that I'm going to give you here in just a second, by 11.59 uh, p.m. this evening, and I will have all the links uh, on the uh, video by the time that we... Uh, when I complete this video that you'll need in order to uh, take advantage of this offer. But if you respond by 11.59 this evening, then you can get an initial consultation, all of, all of the same testing, everything the same, for only $62. Only $62. So that's a significant savings, I think $187 savings or something like that. Uh, so it's quite valuable. Uh, and you can even schedule online. And again, I will give you those links. And so you schedule this appointment online. Uh, you'll have a discount code that you'll see there right on the video, right above the video. Just enter that discount code when you schedule and uh, you'll get that offer, okay? So let me go and look back again, see if anyone. Okay, let's see, Grady says, do beet drinks like super beets aid in circulation as suggested in advertising? Uh, it can. Uh, that helps with uh, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is extremely important for circulation. Um, in fact, that is one of, the, one of the supplements that I may test for individuals, not super beets, but actually the nitric oxide, for individuals who have circulation issues uh, for brain. So super beets can. Um, I'm not sure if they would have the concentrations necessary to make a significant impact within the circulation. But I wouldn't say that the advertising is false because it does 
supply that particular nutrient. Let's see. Cheryl, uh, where, where are we located? Uh, actually, we have two locations. We have one in Houston, uh, specifically in Missouri City. Uh, the address is, uh, n well, I'll, I'll actually put the address in the uh, comments, but it's in Missouri City, so we have one in Houston. And then we have one in Victoria. Um, and I'll also put the address there and the phone numbers for both. Okay, let's see. And hello, Cheryl. <laughs> Okay, Shanna, what are your thoughts on incline bed therapy for circulation, etc.? I'm trying it. Um, actually, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, incline therapy, it's very good. Uh, usually what's recommended is to have the bed, the head of the bed elevated about 30 degrees. Um, it definitely helps with circulation. The thing is, is that the very, the very best way to lay is not comfortable and that's with your your head elevated and your feet elevated so you end up looking kind of like this which obviously doesn't seem very comfortable to me but <laughs> that is for circulation the, the best way to uh, to lay so uh, having having your your head inclined by 30 degrees uh, is very helpful that can in itself completely eliminate snoring uh, it's pretty amazing if you have any type of sinus allergy issues and you wake up in the morning and you always have you know a full head or, or, or pressure congestion within the sinuses and have to blow your nose or whatever, um, you know fluid in the ears, then raising your bed by 30 degrees will help you significantly. So yes, there is a definitely benefit to that. Okay, all right, anything else? Going once, going twice. Okay, so uh, there you have it. That's how not to lose your mind. If you've already lost it, well, sorry, uh, go looking for it. I don't know. No, just kidding, of course. But, uh, you know, there are simple steps that you can take. So you want to eat properly. Um, you want to stimulate your mind. Starting now, no matter what age you are, you can do it through physical activity or mental activity or both. Uh, and you need to work on circulation, you know, improving blood flow. Now, the good thing is, is that sometimes uh, you can strike two birds with one stone, right? So by uh, doing physical activity, movement, all right, you actually stimulate circulation as well. That's when I, uh, for example. So um, really the steps are being as healthy as possible. Probably the biggest one, though, is making sure that your diet is stable of the sugar, which means having low amounts of carbohydrates. It doesn't mean no carbohydrates, um, but you, you must eat stable amounts of carbohydrates, not pastas or breads or grains or sugars. Every time you do that, even if it's just one serving of uh, you know, a pint of ice cream a week, you're increasing the glucose in the brain. I mean, that's where it's gonna go. And then with an increase, you must have a decrease. And that, by the definition, is instability. Okay? So you're causing yourself the very thing that could potentially in the future create your neurodegeneration. So don't do that. Uh, be proactive. You know, let's not see this trend in neurodegenerative diseases continue to increase. And it won't if we ourselves begin taking steps uh, to prevent it and we teach our children and our other family members uh, not to do the things that, that tend to uh, uh, create that effect. All right, uh, let's see. Does expo oh, here's another question from Shanna. Does exposure to chemicals cause brain fog and confusion? It certainly can, uh, no doubt about it. It depends on how it affects it. Um, but yes, the answer is yes, it can. All right. Okay, so that's going to be it this evening. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, next presentation is going to be about how to transform your thinking. So oftentimes, uh, especially the longer you're, you're having a natural health lifestyle, you get your diet in place, you're taking all the right supplements, you're eating all right, you're exercising the way your body wants, wants to be exercised, and you are sleeping the appropriate amount of time. So your lifestyle is great, but yet you still have certain uh, health issues. 
and it boils down, or you might find it difficult to always stay on track with diet, things like that. You have to exert tremendous amounts of willpower, can't eat that, all right? Uh, and it boils down to how we think, our mindset about things. That's what health ends up boiling down to. And so the next presentation, we're gonna be discussing how you can transform your thinking, make new mindsets that help you to uh, really project yourself towards vital health. All right, so again, thanks for attending. Uh, had lots of fun, and if you're watching this later on and you have any further questions, just put it down in the comments, and then as I get notified, I will answer them to the best of my ability. All right, have a great evening.